Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Daniel and Nancy Brophy? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Daniel and Nancy Brophy lived in Portland, Oregon. In 2018, Daniel worked as an instructor at the Oregon Culinary Institute in southwest Portland. Nancy was a self-published romance suspense writer. Starting in 2014, the couple encountered severe financial problems, which by 2016 had worsened to the point where they weren't paying their mortgage. The couple decided to purchase life insurance policies Policies covering Daniel totaled over $800,000. The couple was paying over $1,000 a month just in insurance premiums. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On June 2, 2018, Daniel Brophy arrived at the Culinary Institute in the morning. As he was filling buckets of ice and water at a sink, someone entered the kitchen and shot him in the back using a Glock semi-automatic pistol. After he fell to the ground, the perpetrator shot him again in the chest at close range. The perpetrator left the building, and students discovered Daniel's body a few minutes later. The police started an investigation. Nancy told the police that at the time of the murder, she was in bed writing a book. The police discovered that Nancy had purchased a Glock several months before the murder. Nancy told the police that the gun was for her husband. He needed it for protection while looking for mushrooms. Because everybody knows that when you're out in the woods and a gang of mushrooms decides to attack, it's important to have a lot of firepower available. Their ongoing war with the truffles have left mushrooms battle-hardened and aggressive. In addition to the pistol, Nancy purchased a ghost gun and a slide and barrel for a Glock. She told the police that she purchased the slide and barrel because she was doing research for a novel about a woman who acquired gun parts. Nancy surrendered the pistol to the police. They noticed that the slide was on the frame, but not locked in position. Nancy was arrested on September 5, 2018, in connection with the murder of her husband. In 2020, the police discovered surveillance video, which captured Nancy driving her gray Toyota Sienna minivan in the area of the Culinary Institute during the time of the murder. Daniel had turned off the alarm in the building at 7.22 a.m. Nancy's vehicle was seen driving away from the area at 7.29 a.m. Nancy said that she must have been parked nearby to work on writing a book, but she didn't remember because she had retrograde amnesia from the trauma of her husband being murdered. On May 25, 2022, Nancy was convicted of second-degree murder. At the time making this video, her sentencing is still pending, but considering that she is 71 years old, it seems likely she will be spending the rest of her life in prison. Now moving to my analysis. Was Nancy Brophy actually guilty? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that she was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. In 2011, Nancy wrote an essay titled How to Murder Your Husband. This evidence was excluded from the trial because it was more prejudicial than probative. Nancy and her husband were having financial problems for a while, which really grew out of control in 2016. In 2017, Nancy purchased a ghost gun modeled off of a Glock 19. She never assembled the weapon. She purchased a Glock 17 at a gun show in February of 2018. A few days later, she purchased another slide and barrel for a Glock 17. Nancy turned the Glock over to the police. She claimed that she didn't know where the additional slide and barrel were located. The police determined that the slide and barrel on the Glock were not used in the murder. They noticed that the slide was not completely in place. It was a little forward on the frame. This makes it seem as though Nancy switched the slide and barrel, killed her husband, and then attempted to install the original slide and barrel back on the weapon. The problem was she didn't get the slide all the way back on the frame. Even though Nancy was not able to pay her mortgage, she spent over $1,500 for the gun and the parts. 
The couple was paying over $1,000 a month for life insurance premiums. Nancy claimed this was an investment in their financial future. I think it's more accurate to say this was an investment in Nancy's financial future. Nancy claimed that she never bought ammunition, yet she searched the internet for how to load a Glock. Maybe she just wanted to load it with love and good wishes. She also watched a video on how to remove the slide and barrel. Later, she would claim that she never removed the slide and barrel. She said that the Glock was a heavy and ugly gun, so she didn't use it for anything. A few months before the murder, Nancy visited a public shooting range that did not require people to check in. Nancy's vehicle was captured on video surveillance driving around the Culinary Institute right around the time of the murder. Daniel was shot twice with a Glock. There was no robbery. There was only a six-minute window where he would have been alone in the building. In addition, he was killed on a Saturday, which was the only day this window would have existed. On the other days, he was never alone. How would a stranger know about these time restrictions? Daniel was well-liked and had no enemies. Only Nancy had a motive to murder him. Nancy claimed that she had retrograde amnesia, which conveniently only affected a very small part of her memory around the crime. When the police told her that Daniel was dead, Nancy said, oh, I figured. The police interviewed her for 40 minutes before she asked any questions about Daniel. Nancy visited the Culinary Institute early in the morning, three weeks before the murder, as if she was conducting a test run. She had no other reason to be there. After the murder, Nancy called the police and asked for a letter of exoneration so she could collect a $40,000 life insurance policy. She failed to mention the many other policies, all of which were for larger amounts of money. Moving to the exculpatory evidence, there were no witnesses to the murder. There's no video of it either. Technically, someone else could be responsible. Nancy had no history of killing people. When considering all the evidence, do I think Nancy was guilty? Yes, I think she was guilty in reality and guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Her motive was probably the insurance money. Now moving to my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. During the trial, there was some interesting testimony from mental health professionals. Nancy was assessed with a Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the MMPI. The results indicated that Nancy was independent, problem-solving, and not overly emotional. Nancy lied to her friends about where she was on the morning of the murder, a clinician said that Nancy's brain may have been disrupted when she was relaying that information. That's a novel way of explaining a lie. I wasn't lying. My brain was disrupted. There was testimony suggesting that Nancy was not a psychopath. There were some bizarre opinions rendered about Nancy's memory. Nancy said that she had amnesia, which is why she couldn't remember driving around her husband's workplace near the time when he was murdered. A clinician testified that people can lose memories that take place before a traumatic event. This is true, but it doesn't make sense the way it was explained for this case. What happens with trauma is that a memory may never be encoded. The person doesn't forget what happened, rather the memory never formed in the first place. What's more, the non-encoded portion of that person's experience would be right before they experienced the trauma like maybe the 10 seconds leading up to the traumatic event or something of that nature. When Daniel was killed, Nancy didn't find out for several hours. She would not have perceived the trauma until that time. Her brain would not have magically selected the memories that occurred right before the murder and removed them. It just doesn't make any sense. Another problem with Nancy's memory story is how selective the amnesia was. She remembered a lot of events from the morning of the murder, like talking to neighbors and interacting with the police but she didn't remember driving around her husband's workplace. When Nancy was asked if she could have committed the murder and not remembered, she said that she knew in her heart she did not kill her husband. Item number two, there's been a lot of discussion about Nancy because she was a romance suspense writer. Nancy was a self-published writer, and the quality of her work was very poor. The suspense element in her writing was achieved by the reader hoping that her writing would improve as they were reading the book. By calling herself a writer, Nancy elevated herself well beyond her actual skill level. Her husband may have been her first human homicide victim, but she had been killing plots and storylines for many years. 
Nancy had an inexplicable level of faith in her writing abilities, just like she had in her ability to commit the perfect murder. She wasn't proficient in either area. Item number three, Nancy testified on her own behalf during the trial. She didn't do herself any favors. There was really this sense that she had just given up. For example, she wasn't really trying hard to generate lies which would be believable. It was just too exhausting keeping all the lies straight. At some point, she may have realized that she was going to be convicted one way or the other, so there was no sense in expending a lot of energy. Now moving to my final thoughts. Nancy set out to commit the perfect murder, but did just about everything wrong. She had a combination of traits which led to her being motivated to commit homicide and being capable of committing homicide. For example, she lacked empathy, and she was arrogant, deceptive, and manipulative. Her lack of insight and inappropriately high self-confidence led to her downfall. She believed that she was smarter than law enforcement and just about everyone else. She thought if she could write stories, she could also bring those stories to life. Not surprisingly, the reality she brought forth from her writing was just as terrible as the writing itself. Those are my thoughts in the case of Daniel and Nancy Brophy. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as a gang of attack mushrooms. Thanks for watching.